Welcome to today's talk, everybody. Um, we're very happy to have here today Jeff Brown, who is going to kick off proceedings as we look back at the Northern Carnival against the Nazis, which took place in Manchester in July 1978. We also welcome Bramila Patel and Bernie Wilcox, who will be contributing too. Our events are, as usual, free. However, we would like to encourage you to support the library if you feel able to do so, and there is a donate button on our website. Right, let me share the screen. Okay, Jeff. Okay, all right. Well, um, next, please. Yeah, I mean, I just want to do a, the background, which I think is important um, to give people a, the basis for. Uh, I think of a discussion which enables us to connect what's happening now with what happened then. And I thought the best place to start, or the worst perhaps, is uh, April 1968, when Enoch Powell makes his notorious speech, so-called rivers of blood speech, where he argues that immigration has to be stopped. Uh, and he gets a massive response. You know, half a hundred thousand people write to him and notoriously the dockers, some dockers in London, um, they organize a strike and march on Parliament, and this is the photograph you can see here. Next. And the context of this, if we move on a few years to the mid-70s, is in 68, the National Front, which had been a small organization, got a huge boost. Uh, some of their people describe how they stopped just recruiting cranks, but started winning people from the Conservative Party, for example. The mid-70s, where there was um, the end of the long boom, a massive economic crisis, unemployment shooting up, uh, the government felt necessary for whatever reason to have an IMF loan. Cuts started at this point. If we talk about austerity, 1976 is the year where real wages are falling and uh, hospitals and schools are being closed. Next. And at the same time, there is violence. Uh, the National Front has trebled in size in the last couple of years um, and is not only organizing uh, in elections but is actually uh, organizing violence on the streets. Uh, this is produced by Bethnal Trades Council. It's a pamphlet uh, from this time which is basically detailing the violence including the murder of a man called uh, Good Singh Chaga uh, who is one of a number of uh, people who are murdered uh, at that time. Next. And the, really driving all of this is, as I, is the success of the National Front. It's not a simple story. I mean, the National Front actually, you know, has its own divisions. It splits, in fact. And here we have in the Northwest, the strongest fascist presence was in Blackburn. Um, a man called John Kingsley Reed was the leading figure there. He uh, and another uh, member of another fascist get elected onto Blackburn Council. And here we see uh, the typical uh, National Front march, which these were taking place on a regular basis. Um, solid police support or protection, you could say. And they were basically designed to intimidate uh, you know, the immigrant communities in this case in Blackburn. Um, when uh, Gurdip Singh Chagal was murdered, um, uh, Kingsley Reid's notorious comment was one down, a million to go. Next. And at the same time, um, Eric Clapton, you know, arguably one of the best known musicians, rock musicians of his generation, made a notorious drunken speech from a platform at a gig in Birmingham where he actually says, Enoch is right, get the coons out, uh, uh, keep Britain white. Uh, and it's this uh, drunken diatribe which triggers this uh, um, rock against racism. Uh, a letter is written, uh, next. Uh, a letter is written to the New Music Express and the rest of the music press, uh, pointing out that actually Clapton is singing music which is taken from black musicians. In this case, you know, I Shot the Sheriff is Bob Marley's famous hit, which is making Eric Clapton uh, rich as it happens. Next. 
Um, it's also important to understand that having had a very bad record on taking up racism, um, the trade union movement actually now begins to change. 1976, 77 is the years of the Grumwick strike. This is a group of Asian women uh, coming out on strike uh, in North London uh, and they, their strike triggers a mass response. Um, by the summer of 1977, there are a number of mass pickets of thousands, uh, miners, dockers, uh, ed engineering workers, students. Um, there's a Women's Day uh, at Grumwick Picket Line. This is a massive movement. It's the first time that uh, real solidarity is shown to Asian workers in an industrial dispute. Next. And the National Front, who have had this policy of provocative marches, are finally stopped uh, at what is known as the Battle of Lewisham. If you look at uh, the picture on the left, you can see the thousands of people who uh, are uh, assembling to stop uh, the, the, the fascists from marching through an area with a very big black population. Uh, there's a, a huge crowd of people, including a very large number of local people, many of whom are, as I said, black. Uh, and they actually, for the first time, punch their way through the protection that the police are giving the march um, uh, and are able to actually break it up uh, and stop the front from having their march. This is a, an, a key moment. Next. Um, the, the next move of the National Front is actually to come up to, uh, to this area. Uh, they actually try to have a march in Hyde. That is actually banned. They eventually have a secret march arranged with James Anderton, the Chief Constable of Greater Manchester, um, in Lentum and Longside. At the same time, there is a, a protest in Hyde where, well, Martin Webster has an escort. I assure you this figure is true, of 2,000 police officers so he can have a one-person a one march down the main, you know, the, the Market Street of, of Hyde. There you can see on, on the left. And, there are a number of us who are challenging this. There's a picture of Ramilla who will be speaking shortly. Next. And a couple of months, or a month or so after that, in the House of Commons, there's a press conference chaired by Neil Kinnock, uh, which Peter Hayne uh, fronts up, um, along with Paul Hober, who becomes secretary of the Anti-Nazi League. The Anti-Nazi League, uh, takes off in a way which is quite hard to exaggerate. We see you know, that it's well known for the fact that it, you know, it sells tens of thousands, many tens of thousands of badges, circulates many hundreds of thousands of leaflets, um, and um, it works in very close uh, partnership with, with Rock Against Racism, whose badges are, as you can see here, also something which are an important part of the movement. Next. Uh, the battle continues. Uh, I'm just picking this one out as an example. The National Front are still running. They get a, they get a booking, uh, which is actually done through a, a secret agreement by the, the main parties in Bolton Council to be able to meet in Bolton Town Hall in February the following year. Uh, and next, uh, there are a massive uh, uh, number of people opposing it. Here you see a copy of the leaflet that the, the Anti-Nazi League, which is you know, uh, now you know, taking off properly, is able to circulate in, uh, in Bolton. Next. Um, uh, but at the same time uh, as this announcement has been made in, uh, that there's going to be a carnival, which is something which is new. There's going to be a march and a concert. People are going to assemble in Trafalgar Square. They're going to march to Victoria Park in East London, which was the, the, the strongest base that the National Front had. There's going to be uh, a mixture of punk and, uh, and reggae and music. Actually, Tom Robinson, who's politically uh, you know, very sharp and very keen to support the initiative, is headlining. Uh, we organise all across the country. People are organising to get down there something in the order of 40 something coaches go from Greater Manchester. Here's a poster for one of them. And here we have a group of people who are known for organizing around the Albert pub in, uh, uh, in, in, uh, yeah, in, in, on the Curry Mile now. Uh, 
who are coming down with their banner, which you can see it's Russia, isn't it? Albert against the, the Nazis. Uh, next. Um, as I said, the violence continues. Um, there's a, another murder of a lad called Al Kab Ali uh, in East London. This triggers the first ever actual strike. Um, there's a, a huge protest to the, um, on, on a Sunday and then a strike of something in the order of 5,000 workers in East London on the following, on the Monday, uh, uh, in protest against the murder of Al Tab Ali. Next. Uh, and um, coming out of the, uh, the, 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 the first carnival in end of April is, is the Manchester Carnival, which, um, you know, has this poster done by a man called Dave King, who's also the person who designs the Rock Against Racism badge, an amazingly good designer, inspired by some of the ideas that come out of the art designs, uh, the ideas that come out of the French Revolution, uh, sorry, the, the Russian Revolution. Next. Uh, and this you've already seen, if you had a chance to look at the video we just run, this is the, the initial rally uh, at Strange Ways. Uh, I always make the point that actually you, you, you can't hear it, of course, but there are actually prisoners rattling on the, on the bars of, uh, of the prison uh, at that time in support. Uh, the National Front claimed that their largest bar branch in Manchester was actually inside the prison, uh, prison warders. Next. Uh, we've seen this photograph as well. I mean, Ramilla, who's going to speak in a bit, uh, here is, if you look at it, you can also see, you might recognise Frank Lorne. And on the, on the, on the left, uh, is, is, uh, you can just see it, he's half obscured, is a man called Colin Barnett, who's the Secretary of the North West TUC, who plays an enormously important role. One of the reasons why the carnival is so big in Manchester is because Colin Barnett has actually done a lot to make sure that uh, there is trade union support. Uh, trade union support has been building through the, the previous months uh, and it turns out in, in, in significant numbers uh, at this point. Next. Uh, this is one of the people who speak at, uh, at Strange Ways. He's probably the, one of the best known figures in the whole Northwest because he's the man who fronts the Granada Reports TV programme every, every day at six o'clock. People, everybody knows who Bob Greaves is and he's one of a whole bunch of people, including Tony Wilson and others, but more as the whole of the Granada Reports team um, actually sign up and, and, and support the anti-Nazi League. It's important to remember that the context of this is not one where the media is good. The Manchester Evening News editorial uh, meeting the week before decided they would not cover the carnival. Um, you know, that was their editorial decision. I mean, that they reported on the traffic jams it caused, but they didn't report uh, the actual event. Next. So here is people getting ready to move off. Uh, you can see one of the, well, you can see a couple of the wagons that have got bands on, uh, you know, getting ready to go. Next. Um, and it's impossible to show everybody who supports, but it's a, it's very important to understand that one of the reasons why the Anti-Nazi League works is because it manages to get this fantastic breadth of support in terms of getting the left to organize together to get people to, to uh, the gay movement is a very important part of, 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 the, of the movement at the time. It's, um, you know, just beginning to sort of take off, you know, as a significant force. Uh, and uh, it's very much part of what's going on. Next. Uh, this one, again, I mean, I love this particular slogan, the blood of all races. <laughs> nourishes the NHS. It's obviously got a huge relevance today. Next. And this is marching across Hume. As you can see, Colin Barnett is actually, he, he having said to people, they won't mind marching all the way from Strange Ways to Alexandra Park, which is a long way. He actually, to give him credit, went to the front and uh, walked the entire distance. Next. Okay, and here's just an idea of the size of the crowd that's there. I mean, this is not the only photograph of the crowd. There are many, but it's a sense of, you know, of how we have 40,000 people there. Next. Uh, and this, again, is a, a much reproduced photograph of Buzzcocks playing. Next. And here again uh, is uh, still Pulse with uh, their playing, doing their song Ku Klux Klan. Next. Uh, here is uh, 
couple of people who obviously are there. Uh, that's a, board, a, a, a stage pass that uh, Pete has got on his pin to his shirt. Next. And that's it, is it? Yes, I think that is it. Yes, excellent. That is it. Okay, so I've done the, the intro. Um, I, I'd, I'd actually like to sort of, if we can, just start with a few people who I've sort of primed a little bit. So I've asked for Ramilla if she'll say a few words. Okay. Well, it's, um, it's just brought back so many memories. And the difficult thing to remember is that all this was happening 42 years ago. And it could, it could easily well be right now. And those are the connections we have to remember that racism did not end ever, you know, it, it continues. And um, about those times, we had no cell phones, some of us had landlines, the communication was absolutely primitive, but we got things done. You know, we, we had the discipline to make things move. Um, I lived in a small town, uh, Bolton, I lived there for 20 years and my introduction to politics really came about from going on a picket outside Bolton Town Hall because my art school was being closed down and at this picket I began to realize all sorts of things so my eyes were opened I met somebody who'd been in the international brigade had actually gone to Spain I met people there from the SWP um, and that sort of got me involved. And at the same time, what was actually happening across the world was June 16. The Soweto uprisings were happening. All right, I was just a little bit older than the students who were leading all that protest, but that was also a very, very significant influence on young people, young Asian people that I hung out with, people I hung out at the art school with. So for us, that was a defining moment and it came from across the world. So that was another introduction to internationalism. And as I'm in education, I still believe in internationalism. And that's one of the things we do, you know, we put a big emphasis on international mindedness. So for us, that moment kind of introduced us, introduced a lot of us to be immersed in fighting racism. And we had a slogan saying, you just jump on it, don't let the, don't let, uh, the Nazis uh, rise, you jumped on it any moment that you saw it. And I think as a teacher, that's been important. You sort of, all those moments, you know, you find those moments and you react to them. And with the Black Lives Movement protests, I mean, that, that is amazing at the moment, what's been happening. Not amazing because George Floyd is killed. But young people, to see them on the streets is absolutely fabulous. Because street politics died down for quite a while. People it was easy to press a button on the social media. All right, that's relevant because that's really what we're having to do. Even me, isolated here on the mountain, I'm having to resort to the keyboard protest, as I'm calling it. But what I like about the protesters that have come out with the BLM is not only are they opposing the strong arm of the law, like we did on those a &L marches, they're also... They've also got the invisible enemy, which is COVID-19. So against all odds, they're coming out. And to see that in young people, and 40 years later, after having been young ourselves, that is, is a defining moment. And, you know, we, we look to that next generation to, well, to continue the, the, the fight. Um, not sure what else I can say. The carnival was absolutely fabulous. Um, and of course, I did go to the London one as well, which was enormous. 
and I went to the one in Leeds as well. And what was absolutely, I have to, copy, I have to stop saying amazing, I think the number of musicians who spoke up and to see an anti-Nazi league sticker on the guitar when they were playing, you know, if they appeared on top of the pops or whatever, and you went, yeah, you know, they're part of us. They think like us. So that, that was also revolutionary and radical. The whole campaign changed. The stickers, the flyers, the flags, the carnival feel was there at the demonstrations we went to. So again, lots of things were happening. The Grunwick pickets, you know, we all piled into a bus at midnight from Manchester, traveled all night so we could arrive early morning. And again, as I said, all this we did without social media. And we were there all together. You know, it was cool to be anti-racist and it still is cool to be anti-racist. We never stopped. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think people should indicate um, if they want to speak. Um, I want to invite a few people who were actually there on the day. Uh, I know Bernie is, has particularly wants to make a point. Of, um, and I just before I bring Bernie in, uh, is there anybody who really would like to? I mean, I, I, I should introduce Richard, who's sitting next to me, um, uh, an avowed technophobe who's chosen to... <laughs> just do a not quite properly distanced event uh, appearance here um, and I just like to and there's also Phil and there's Cynthia and others um, and Ian who were there at the time I know I don't know if any of you have got any particular points that you would like to make about the relevance of then looking at it today Bernie is unmuted I'm just trying to unmute Phil well, Richard's okay. He's got a thing. <laughs> well, also... Bernie. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm happy. Um, I, I'd just like to talk about statues. Bad things um, were then. And that how, and <clears throat> racism hasn't gone away, but it has changed. We've made some gains. It would be generally unacceptable to make a racist comment in a place of work these days. That would not be on. Uh, the stuff you get on the television has changed. But racism hasn't gone away. And in fact, if you start looking at the Home Office, I would say it was institutionally racist from top to bottom in terms mm, of the, mm. uh, and, and directed by government in terms of the, um, uh, the Windrush scandal and the um, uh, yeah. environment. Yeah, the hostile, hostile environment. environment. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then you've got, <clears throat> so there's, there's racism and then there's the hardcore fascists who still lurk but they're mostly on social media. But then you've got in America, you've got Trump giving the white supremacists legitimacy. So I think whilst we made a lot of progress, it's no question of being um, sitting comfortable. There's a lot of work to be done. There's eternal vigilance, mm -hmm. and there's persistence, and there's campaigning that's still not got to be done. And the Black Lives Matter movement is really very encouraging. And a lot of the commentators have said, it's different now because it's a mixture of white and black, whereas before it was just black. And that makes a big difference, I think. Bernie? Yeah, sure. Um, first, I'd like to make the point that we have made... Bernie, you can have you to unmute me? yourself. Oh, no, he's, we can hear him, Jeff. Okay. He's unmuted. You have to unmute yourself. Jeff, it's fine. Bernie is unmuted. Go for it, Bernie. Yeah, yeah. I think we have made tremendous progress. Um, I'll, I'll just re recall a little story from the other weekend. He has um, you, sir. Right, I don't, Jeff. Yeah, he I'm was back. Jeff. He was unmuted. It was working fine. I don't know what's problem with you. You. I'm just trying to. I think there's too many of us trying to do it, Bernie. You're unmute, you're unmuted, as far as I'm concerned. Please go for it. Right, okay. So, so uh, we have made tremendous progress. L little story from the other week. I uh, had a, uh, a friend of mine around with his daughter. We were talking about Faulty Towers being banned. She asked me why, why it was banned. I said, I'll, I'll play the clip 
and it was the, the major in Faulty Towers um, talking about. Uh, we're okay, Jeff. Don't worry. Yeah, was it us? Um, no, it's obviously running. You see, just that we can't. <laughs> I, I, I just have to keep muting Jeff. <laughs> keep going, Bernie. Okay. Yeah. Jane, so, could you so, send Jeff a message? Sh shall I send Jeff a quick message? No, I, I've got somebody else doing that. Go okay, for it. Right, very good. Uh, and, and so uh, she, she asked me to play it. Got up on YouTube, and uh, the major in um, in um, Faulty Towers was talking about uh, wogs and niggers. And this 22 year old daughter of my friend said, What's a wog? She did. She never ever heard the word before. Twenty-two years old. Now, if you'd have said that forty-two years ago, um, it would have been in common use every day on every street. So to say we've made no progress is just completely wrong. However, I don't think statues is where the progress is. I think I think it's employment. And I've got a particular interest in this because I've been in the recruitment industry for nearly forty years, and um, I, I see even now there is, uh, from quite liberal sort of white people, there's an unconscious uh, discrimination against people with uh, foreign names on their CV. Um, but b because the, the economy's been in a boom for quite a while, then um, black people, I don't think, have had a problem getting a job. That they, they can't get as good a job but they can't get, uh, they, they don't have a great problem getting the job. The problem is, is promotion. And if we look at the, uh, the FTSE 3, 350, the top 350 companies in the, in the UK, only 7% of those directors are from a Bain background. Uh, John Lewis has um, recently appointed um, a black uh, lady of um, Jamaican descent, her mum and dad were from Jamaica, uh, Sharon, to, to be their chairwoman. Um, John Lewis claimed they've got six out of the 158 senior uh, staff uh, from a Bain background, but they can only name four of them. One's Sharon, one's somebody that Sharon appointed, and the other two were there before. Um, now, we all think of John Lewis as being quite a right-on sort of uh, employer, but actually it's I've got about 4% of their senior staff are from a Bain background. So. The, the, the thing that will make the difference to most uh, ethnic minorities' lives is uh, in employment opportunities and is uh, promotion opportunities. And that's the key thing for us, I think, the next battle. Tearing down a statue just doesn't help anybody, doesn't improve anybody's life. Um, but, but, but improving employment and promotion opportunities certainly will. Over to you, Lynette. Thank you. I'm going, I'm going to pass across to Phil. Yeah, Phil, you are unmuted. After that, I'm going to try and get back to Jeff and hope that he can hear us all. But Phil, over to you. Okay, th thanks. Um, I was, um, I think I was 24 years old in, 1970, in um, 1978. Um, and I guess I would say I was um, uh, interested in politics, interested in left-wing politics, um, but not organised in any way. I wasn't a member of anything. Um, but um, I do remember the carnival and the, the build-up to it um, very clearly. Um, and I took, I took some photographs on the day and, and you, a few of those photographs, what, a, a different photograph, uh, Jeff um, mentioned homemade banners. These were, these were the um, Albert against the Nazis. And I think it's interesting that you see today on a lot of the, uh, the Black Lives Matter marches, um, the number of people who are clearly new to politics because they're making their own banners. They, they want to say what they want to say. They want to say their own thing. And um, I remember I lived in a house in, um, in Longsight um, on Scarsdale Road. And I think one, one of the photographs there is Scarsdale Road against the Nazis. Um, it was it was our house basically. It was the people who lived in our house, um, and we were we were students and ex students, and there was something about that period in which whole numbers of people who I, I guess you would have to say were politically not necessarily active or conscious in any way were suddenly galvanised into seeing this as as an important issue, 
And so I, I agree with um, what's been said already in, in terms of the, the, the video and what Jeff said earlier, in terms of this being a, um, something of a watershed and signaling the fact that things, the, the political balances seem to be shifting in our favor after, after a long period of, 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 of darkness in which the, the, the growth of fascism uh, seemed to be uh, sort of ever, ever onward. Um, and I do think there are, there are therefore parallels that we, we can draw today. I'm speaking um, today from, from France, where I think the traditions of fighting um, fascism are very different from the traditions in Britain. And certainly um, we have here the Rassemblement National, the old National Front with uh, Marine Le Pen um, as its leader, who are a mainstream party, a uh, so-called um, established party in France. They, they poll uh, millions of people in elections. She stood against Macron in the presidential election um, last time around. And they're, they're a, a, a serious threat. Their brand of politics is, um, I guess you would call it left-wing fascism with a, a so-called respectable gloss. They, they try to dismiss the, their history of uh, fascism, the, the history of, of, her, of her father and the, um, and the open anti-Semitism that it used to have. And, they, and, and to some extent, that strategy has been successful. One of the consequences has been in France that the, um, and it's a consequence to do with the way that the left in France have treated the so-called secularization of society which, um, without going into it, it, dates back to the French Revolution, when the idea of the, the fight against the, the church was a progressive idea. Um, and that's completely turned on its head now. Secularization is being used as a weapon to attack religious minorities. And so, um, th five, four or five years ago, you had the experience of Je suis Charlie, I am Charlie, after the Charlie Hebdo offices were bombed. Um, and the whole of France, it seemed, came out saying that um, I, am, uh, I am with the, um, the people who, who, who were bombed. And therefore, um, I am against um, the people who perpetrated that. Therefore, the logic being the secularization, the Republican tradition, I am against um, anybody from a religious minority who wishes to show that they're from a religious minority. That has fueled the support for the National Front and unfortunately the left, the established far left even, have gone along with that and, and, and failed to challenge it. And so anti-Semitism, anti Islamophobia have been rife in France and seriously not challenged. And on the back of that, the, the Front National um, have managed to grow. What has been remarkable over the last couple of weeks as a result of the Black Lives Matter protests and, and what's, what has happened in America is that we have 30,000 black, black and white people on the streets in Paris protesting against uh, police violence. And they, um, they identified um, a guy called Adam, Adama Traore, who was a French, a French national who was murdered by the police um, by um, a, 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 a method very similar to what occurred in, um, in, in um, in America, um, called called, um, called prone restraint, in which they in which they murdered him. This was back in 2016, and 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 so they are looking at the role of the French police in relation to police violence. And if you think about the French police, the French police are notoriously racist. Um, very recently, there was a scandal. I say a scandal because I think five years, ten years ago, it wouldn't have been a scandal where two Facebook groups um, with rabid racism were exposed as being full of policemen, I mean, police officers, police, these are police Facebook groups. And it's been estimated that a 15th, one in 15 of all French police were members of these two Facebook groups. And it's known that their membership and support for fascist, fascist organizations is significant. So it's really a watershed that suddenly the police in France are being outed as being racist. And you have uh, government ministers now saying we have to look into this, the fact that uh, the French police might be racist. 
this could never have been said years ago. The so-called tradition of um, the police being out, uh, away, outside of politics completely and not getting involved and the idea that the French police could be racist was something that would not be, would not be aired publicly, in, uh, politically in France before. So I do think what's happening now, I'm hoping, um, is another watershed, a shift in the balance of forces after, after we've had quite a few years of the growth of far-right parties in Europe and around the world, you can see the glimmers of, 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 of the counter to that in, the, in, in what's taking place in many countries today. And, and uh, it does take me back a little to 1978 and uh, what a time that was as well. Thank you. Thanks very much. Jeff, before I try and come back to you, I'm just going to try and unmute Robert Poole because he says he has a diary of the day's events. So uh, we can't see you, Robert, but can we hear you? Can you hear me? Uh, it's a bit crackly. Give, us a, give it a go. A bit crackly, okay. Um, yeah, I, was, I just finished being tuned at the time. I just done my finals. And um, I, I was living in Lancaster. Um, but to hitch down to Manchester, and I've got a short diary entry about about the ten year. I just asked, I see steel pulses. Can you not hear me? No, I don't think that's. I'm not sure that's working, Robert. I don't know. Uh, that that wasn't really working for me. Let me just ascertain. Were other people able to hear that? No, I'm getting shaking heads. Sorry, Robert. We might try you again if you can move. I don't know. Move on to a different device, maybe. It, oh, sorry about that. Um, I'm going to try unmuting Jeff now, although that, that screen's gone blank, so interesting. Okay. Jeff, can we, ah, oh, yes, there you are. Right, okay. okay, can you hear us? I can hear you. No, it's fine, what? really. But I just wanted to, I mean, really, I want to keep the discussion moving. Um, I mean, I'm aware of the fact that, you know, there are other people who haven't yet, uh, who haven't yet spoken. And so, um, I mean, really a question, I think, uh, I think uh, Frank Ellis, um, you know, raised the question of how do we deal with historic racism, um, which I think is obviously something which is important, you know, uh, but having said that, my impression is that the way in which most of us are looking at it now is that whereas we will continue to take on historic racism, you know, we will still to argue that we've got the wrong statues in Manchester, we're not going to make the statues the key issue for us. Um, and what we really want to do, I think, is to find ways of taking the inspiration from the past, but applying it very much to the here and now. Um, I'm, I'm just acutely aware that, I, that there are other people who should be indicating that they want to, uh, they want to speak. I mean, uh, I, I'm aware of, for example, people like um, uh, uh, I don't know, Cynthia and Ian were there on the day. Um. Well, uh, Jeff, you, you're a co-host. You can unmute anybody that you want to. So um, go for it. Right. I just want to know how I do this. Right. So I, <laughs> oh, I can Gordon, do it. Right. Gordon, Gordon has raised his hand. We, we, I'm, I'm just about to unmute Gordon. I've, I've interviewed. Bye. Right. I've, yeah, I'm, yeah, Cynthia and. Uh, right. Okay, Gordon, you're on. Yeah, there was, <clears throat> there was a, a busy year. Uh, just a story going down to Lewisham. I met with a, a few friends from Stockport outside the central bus station and Mike Luff, uh, I know, so was it Penny, was hanging out chair legs and we wondered what was happening and then Mike Luff said, oh, well, they found out where the National Front coach was going from and Mike Luff, who was, he still is, I think, he was still with us, um, uh, an anti-fascist and we walked down to um, just a Piccadilly and when we got we got stopped on the way somebody asked us the way but when we got there we noticed that the group of students had ventilated the um, the coach and Mercedes which the NF was supposed to be going down on and the organizer looked out and saw us as a four and when we came back, they tried to pin it. I mean, we weren't actually involved in the violence. We got there just after it ended. His coach was driving away. But they tried to nail it on Mike Luff, and I was one of the uh, one of the witnesses, but we didn't even get called. They got thrown out. 
but uh, it's quite uh, interesting. There was lots of little things going around that. Yeah. And it was, um, about, I think that was just after the um, just after the Northern Carnival. But the one in London was noticeable because there was hardly any police. They only expected a couple of thousand, and you had what twenty thousand meet. Uh, walking all around London with absolutely no police around uh, and no trouble. So it was um, interesting. But just one point on the political side is what happened in 79, in many ways Thatcher on immigration stole the uh, NF's clothes and managed to get a lot of popular support and elected. And I think based on, you know, immigration, so we didn't quite win everything. No, we didn't. No, absolutely. It all can, the fact that, um, can I un, un, unmute um, John Charlton, who wants to say something about football? Okay. John Charlton, who wants to say something about football? Are you doing that or are you asking me to do it, Jeff? I've just done it, I think. Uh, can, can I be heard? Yes, you can. Hello. Okay. Right, well, I, I'm, speaking, I'm speaking from Newcastle, but... Um, at the time of the Manchester Carnival, I was in Leeds, <clears throat> and um, I, I was one of the co-organisers of a, an enormous contingent of people who came across from Leeds and other places in West Yorkshire. Um, you know, see, it's the next big conurbation to Manchester. Um, the, the, the Leeds turnout was terrific, but I want to um, I wanted to say um, one thing about then and one thing about now, and then I start about then. Uh, I, I would like to mention the um, the football fans against the Nazis. <clears throat> this was a, an astonishing movement, really. Um, I, I have I have still got probably twenty badges from different football groups from uh, 1978. <clears throat> it's hard to understand today. I think that because um, when you when you saw the Black Lives Matters kneeling. At the new at the first Premier League matches, you might find it hard to believe that in the 1970s the climate was entirely different, and uh, Leeds was one of the centres of Nazi activity, and uh, Elland Road, the Leeds United football ground, was a very important focus for them every other Saturday, and uh, being aware of that, we we really wanted to uh, organize some kind of counter demonstration at Ellen Road. Okay, well, we did it a few times. And um, I, I, truthfully, we had to be pretty brave. Um, the, the young people, mainly young people, of course, who came there, mainly students, I have to say at that time, had to be pretty brave because you never knew who would be on your side and who would not be on your side. So apart from the obvious Nazi contingent, you never quite knew well, the, what you might call the general level of football fans would think about the anti-Nazi standing there. Okay, forward to a particular day when we had what could be called a minor triumph. Um, I, I was very active in the, uh, in the IS and the SWP at the time. And uh, we, we had a, a project during that period of trying to recruit and build branches in, in workplaces, factory branches. And one great success, um, which I guess we were only partly responsible for, but it happened anyway, was that we had, we managed to get a branch among construction workers in Leeds. And these are guys who worked on power stations, you know, they were traveling around from place to place. Uh, but there were natives of West Leeds, Armley particularly, which was um, a kind of Nazi breeding ground. Well, a couple of these guys, I have to say, were pretty big, physically big. They were very, very big lads, actually. Um, and um, uh, they, they, kept, they adopted, really, Marxist politics, revolutionary politics. It's, it seems a little extraordinary, but they certainly did. And they built this group. They came on this particular day to Ellen Road, and it was the first time they'd made an appearance. And they faced up to the Nazis, sort of nose to nose. And it was a terrifying moment for the Nazis, because until then, they'd been able to characterize 
the anti Nazis as pufters and students. That sort of language was used, you see. This made a difference. Now, that all feeds into building the anti Nazi League because it was always seen as very important to broaden the social base of the anti Nazi League. So uh, that was important, but, but taking a little bit forward from there, because someone mentioned the 1979 election and the coming of Margaret Thatcher. Well, um, that's an interlude, <laughs> but as you know, within a decade, we're involved in the, the great miner strike. And uh, lots of people, probably a lot of people who are on here today um, participated in minor support groups and all of that. But there was a link between the two because people who had come to us, come to the anti-Nazi League, um, came to the politics more widely. And that's what I want to take forward to today to say. Now, I don't actually agree that um, statue um, activity is no use. On the contrary, I think statue activity is a hell of a lot of use because it, cr it creates an active focus for particularly young people and not only black people, but especially black people and others. It has taken those people onto the street. And when they, uh, when, they, when they took the statue down in Bristol, I feel that was one of the great moments of this decade, actually, because I think something shifted in the national consciousness during that moment. I know it's a spin-off from the United States, of course it is, but in building any movement, you have to, you have to be aware and sharply and, and direct yourself sharply to such events because those events are important. Now, will it go on? We don't know. And what is absolutely sure is that we white people, and I think everybody, nearly everybody on this uh, chat today is white. Um, I think we have to understand actually where often black people are coming from when you, when you raise the statue question. And uh, someone did say this to me, some black comrades said it to me uh, recently that uh, walking past the Colston statue in Bristol always gave offense. Mm. Now, lots of white people, the radicals, will walk past the Colston statue every day of their lives and they may register some kind of intellectual opposition to it. But the passion um, that was transferred onto whipping that statue down, largely among young black people, was very, very significant. And if the black movement, as it seems to be growing at the moment, focuses on other statues, I say, great. But of course it's not true that that's the end of it. That's the beginning of it. And widening, I think, widening the uh, political issues, taking the issues from um, uh, Black Lives Matter by black people into questions like employment um, and, 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 and the treatment of black people in the NHS and so on is also obviously very, very important. Okay, I've probably spoke long enough, sorry. <laughs> Well, thank you, John. Um, has anybody else indicated? Robert would like another go. He's, tr he's moved microphone, so let's see okay. if we can get... Let's give him a go. Go on, Robert, try again. Hello. Am I audible now? I've got a separate microphone. Still not great. Try Say, say something else. Um, I'll, talk, I'll talk you straight into the microphone. It's the best I can do. Can you hear me? No, I'm afraid it's not. I, no, it's not working. I'm sorry, Robert. Uh, he, he's offered to send through a, a transcript, which um, I think that's a great idea. Thank you very much. Really, really sorry about that. Right. Uh, Bernie's indicated he'd like to come back. I can't find him to unmute him. Oh, yes, I can. We've got the... Bernie, you've got it. Yeah. Okay. Can you hear me, everyone? Yeah. yeah. yeah good, good. Um, it, it was interesting. Uh, I'm a big Manchester City fan, and uh, most of you will know about uh, the banner that was flown over the uh, City Burnley game uh, the other night, where a, a, a banner behind a plane said, White Lives Matter, Burnley, and it was done by this... Uh, friend of Tommy Robinson's and all the rest of it. After the game, uh, Ben Mee, who's the Blackburn, uh, the Burnley captain, 
came on and he said, I don't want to talk about football. I want to talk about that banner. And he spent five minutes saying how wrong it was. And it was fantastic. It's really good to get um, a captain of a premiership team, a white captain, saying all that. But what concerns me is that we, we just tell people that this is the right thing. And we do nothing to convince them. And we think that by closing down the debate, by saying to people who don't agree with us that they're racist or they're Tory or they're something else, they're a, ra they're a fascist, that that's enough, that, that, that it doesn't really matter. But actually, all those people in the red wall seats who voted for Boris, calling them a Tory doesn't really help. No. Be because they, they say, yes, I am a Tory, I voted Tory. It's a big, big bloody deal. We, we've got to engage people in debate. So when we, there, there is a problem with Black Lives Matter in the slogan. I don't think the slogan is a particularly good one. Um, but if, if you go to El Paso, for instance, then it, it's not so much the, the blacks that get the uh, beatings from the uh, police. It, it, it's the, the Mexicans. Um, it's, it's, a lot of it is uh, racist against blacks but it's racist against anybody who's not white um and um if we just say that that's it our way is correct um the reason uh, we don't explain why uh black lives matter does count um if we don't explain that properly people won't be with us and all we're doing is we're just closing down people who disagree with us and the media are on our side. The media are with us. So the media close those down as well. Um, the, the, um, the, 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 the general um, Twitter artery close everybody down. People lose their jobs because they don't follow the, 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 the accepted line. But that, in the end, that doesn't change people's minds. We've got to get back to debating politics with people and debating why we're correct rather than just trying to shove it down their throat because we tend to control the media. Okay. Okay, thank you, Bernie. Anybody else want to, uh, to contribute? Um, I'm doing a quick scan through. I'm not seeing it. Right. Because if not, oh no, Jean. One second. Jean, you have the floor. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, beautiful. Right, okay, thank you. Um, yes, I was there, and what a wonderful day. Um, and what a wonderful day in Leeds and London, all of those things. And one of the things I remember from around that time, and I think somebody's mentioned it, is that you walked around town, you walked down Market Street, and, you know, one in two people would have an anti nazi Badge on. There was a very visible um, anti-racist president presence, and I, and I think that's something that we could aspire to do. Um, you know, today the badge would be different, um, but I, th I think it's I think it's important to have a very visible presence like that. And I, I just wanted to talk about the three big discussions that I've been having or that are being had on the Black Lives Matter demonstrations you know, the biggest one of which was 15,000 in Manchester every Wednesday for the last three weeks. You know, it's four weeks tomorrow when George Floyd was murdered. So every week for the last three weeks, stand up to racism and other organisations and people not in any organisation have been having quite big gatherings, some of them 200, some of them 50. You know, these are all very socially distanced um, protests. I mean, obviously, the one that was 15,000 in Manchester, you know, started in a socially distant fashion and, and ended up differently. But the things that people were talking about, all of these young people, they were talking about police brutality in the States, but they were talking about police brutality here. And they can, just like anybody else who's involved in left-wing politics, can reel off the names of people that have been killed or investigations where, you know, the police have said, no, it wasn't racism, so there was no proper investigation. But they talked about the virus as well. They talked about why is it? We know lots of black people work in hospitals and they, like lots of other people, use black in a political sense. They're talking about 
all non-white people, if you like. So why is it that health workers who are black, you know, are dying? Why is it that transport workers, why, why are the number of deaths so disproportionate? And they're making, you know, all, all of those links, which I think is fantastic. And I think it's, I think it's a real shift. I think in the same way that the XR and the school student strikes on Friday, you know, they happen for a very long time, put the, put the discussion about climate change in the centre of politics and meant that people had to take it up, even though they haven't got the government, haven't got the answers. I think this movement now in Britain is doing the same for racism and I don't think it's going to go away. I mean, it will change shape or change form, but I think, I don't think it's going away, going to go away. And they, these organisations are starting to form very concrete demands and working with the trade unions. You know, the NEU have tried for a long time to talk about how the curriculum should be shaped, that it should talk about British imperialism, that the whole bloody history of that, not just the glorification of, um, you know, of statues. I absolutely agree with the statues coming down as well. Um, you know, so the NEU unions are starting to get involved with the movement on the streets. The demands are coming up about tasering, about housing, about jobs, you know. So I, I just feel extremely hopeful. And I, I think the whole thing in football has changed as well. You know, 12 months ago, when a footballer lifted their shirt, if they had a, anything to do with anti-racism on, you know, they would be fined. So the, the attitude at the top of football you know, has meant that players could do what they've been doing. And I think that matters because it's screened to millions of people on, on the TV. And hopefully when the schools do go back, that might encourage, you know, those sort of discussions to be had in school football teams and so on. So I just think it's a very important, very important shift. Okay. Any more? Thank you, Jean. Any more? Okay. Hang on, is Steve, Steve Roman, are you waving a, a hand at me? Steve Roman, do you wish to speak? Uh, yes, he does. Hang on. Yes, Go, Thank you. So, Steve, yes, will, yeah, give on. A couple of interesting points about broadening the, the campaign. There's an item in Private Eye this week about Sean Bailey, who the black... Um, contender for the Tory mayor of London and his spokesperson says our capital has an opportunity to elect its first black mayor. Um, I had to do a double take because I regard Sajid Khan as black but the Sean Bailey perhaps using race in a different way by claiming he's black but Sajid Khan isn't. Um, so I'll just leave that there, that's an interesting one. The other relates also to a statue, and that's the statue of Mahatma Gandhi in Manchester, which was um, erected last year. And there has been a call from Man some Manchester University last year, and I saw it repeated this year, uh, for the Gandhi statue to be taken down. Now, I, while I'm happy, welcome the Colston statue being taken down. I also now support the um, what Manchester City Council is doing in reviewing all its statues and I'm a strong supporter of interpreting statues fully and giving a lot more information about them and Gandhi in particular needs to be interpreted because yes what he wrote while he was in South Africa was very racist as we'd regard it now. But um, he is, was uh, of a minority in South Africa. He was in that hierarchy of racism in South Africa. Um, but of course, his approach, his later approach, I, I don't know how much he recanted, but his later approach to nonviolence action to, for social change is the reason why he is now honoured around the world and that needs to, non-violence needs to be 
um, something that we honor through him, but he needs, it needs in Manchester as elsewhere, statues like of him to be properly interpreted, to give a balanced view. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any more? Right. Hold on. I'm trying to unmute you, Ray. Perhaps my colleague Jane. Yeah, can no, there you go. We're up. Yes, thank go you. on. Um, just to refer to statues again, I know we've spoken a lot about that, but it was so symbolic. And what is desperately disappointed me was the reaction of Keir Starmer to say, you know, violence against property. Yes, I mean, he might as well have been a Tory because they always raise um, uh, this when we have protest movements. I remember back uh, the Greenham time, you know, when we were protesting against nuclear weapons, we were apparently really violent because we cut a fence. It was against the law. And for Keir Starmer to say that recently, it really depressed me so much. Here we have a new leader of the Labour Party. I can see everybody, you know. <laughs> but, you know, it's our main opposition party. And he, he shouldn't have said that. It, it, it was just awful. I just, I, I, uh, I'm so depressed. Here we have a new leader and hoping for better things. Um, no, I know we won't get to socialism, but at least, you know, to get a bit nearer socialism uh, with the general electorate. And, and there he, uh, you know, just condemns this because it's violence against property. Oh, goodness. Just wanted to make that point. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Hi. I think we may be getting to that. I don't know if... if... Romila, you're the furthest away. Do, 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 uh, you're kind of a very special guest from that point of view. And Any, any more that you'd like to, to add? Um, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know. I think everybody wants to to hear somebody from the top give some type type of support or speak out. And as I was saying with the anti Nancy League, when we saw those great musicians with the stickers on their guitar, it gave us increased hope. And that's those are the little moments that kept us going. And I'm not sure if I've ever kept a record of how many times I've been disappointed hmm. when somebody hasn't spoken out because we look up to these people and same in the media industry, you know, those actors and actresses, et cetera, et cetera. I heard John Carney, um, the South African actor speak uh, last year on gender based violence and his message to the actors and actresses was, well, speak out because people, you live in people's lounges because, you know, the soap, soap actors and actresses, if they open their mouth, people sit up and listen. So that is something that takes so long. And there are some powerful people who have a big following. You know, there's a stand-up comedian and who's an ex-student of mine, lives in Manchester. You know, if he says little things and he has a following, we, we think, okay, that's a, that's a good moment. And the politicians, the number of times they've disappointed us, you know? And um, Mahatma Gandhi, they, they tore down his statue in West Africa because of his statements. So people have contradictions. And some of those contradictions only surface when somebody triggers and says, now what about... You know, and as a teacher, you know, it takes years to find these little moments where you don't know what you're doing half the time. But there will be somebody who will go away and read homage to Catalonia and things will make sense all of a sudden. So it's what I'm trying to say is even 40 odd years later, 
it continues, the fight continues. Now, Catherine, who was here, I'm sorry, I didn't get a chance to speak before she left. She tuned in from Johannesburg. And I said, you know, I was privately messaging, I said, but the cause was the same. The same people went to those anti-apartheid marches in London. You know, we were there. We, we, the, the fight was the same. Apartheid in South Africa. As I said, the Soweto students influenced us in a little town in Bolton and uh, across the world. And if you took the number of people living in small villages and boycotting South African goods, you thought, what, what a wild moment because it started small and then boycott Barclays pickets and then it went on. And okay, for me, the fantastic moment was the release of Mandela. But those things took a long, long time. And we have a lot of disappointments along the way, don't we? And, and Jeff, what keeps us going? <laughs> I put that to Jeff, who I've known him the longest. <laughs> Well, well, yeah. Well, thank you, uh, Ramilla, for that. I mean, I, I, I mean, I do feel that um, you know th th you're right. This is a struggle which is going on, as Richard said earlier. This is a struggle which has been, you know, we have still got a long way to go. And I very much take uh, Bernie's point that labelling people racist and fascist doesn't actually take the argument further. I think what really brings the, the memory of the uh, Rock Against Racism and Anti-Nazi League brings home now is how the involvement of tens of thousands of people coming out uh, together actually does move things forward in a way that, you know, we always have to have the arguments and you, we have to have, as uh, Ramilla's just said, you know, that patience that keeps struggling over years and decades. But history very often accelerates and, I think what we've seen in the last month, and it's astonishing that it is just a month. Uh, that, you know, yeah, I live in Prestwich, you know, it's a small place. We had a hundred and something people out taking the knee a couple of weeks ago. We're doing it again tomorrow on the uh, month uh, after the death of George Floyd. Uh, and we're, again, we'll get well over a hundred people there. And my point is that this is a real movement and it's, movements that, that, that change people with the arguments, of course, which we have to have. And I, I take John's point about how you know, the movement to bring down Colston's statue really, it wasn't a matter of destroying history, it was making history. And um, you know, as such, you know, bringing statues down is part of the movement. I, I, I just think that we need to think of the many ways in which the movement is being built of which statue Changing the statutes is only one. Okay. Uh, but Bernie, did you want to say something? You were, uh, uh, hang on, don't start yet, because I, I need to unmute you. Sorry, uh, for some reason, it always takes about six clicks. Okay, Ooh, not yet. Yeah, yeah wait, wait, with, with Kilson's statue, um, I, I've, I've never had any faith in the Labour Party delivering any form of socialism at all. And if you take Bristol Council, that they've got 36 Labour councillors, there's 11 Greens, there's nine Liberal Democrats, there's 14 Conservatives. Um, so they've got a massive majority, you could call it progressive majority, that could have taken this statue down. They've got an elected mayor, a Labour mayor who's mixed race, who could have taken this statue down. None of these Labour and Liberal uh, politicians ever bothered to do that. So my question to anybody here in the Labour Party is, um, are these people politically incorrect? Are they incompetent? What, what is it? What, why haven't they done this? Why has it taken some kids at a demonstration to put that in the drink rather than them doing it themselves? All right, thank well, you. To anybody in the Labour Party to, to answer. <laughs> there you go. To what being put on the spot. Um, all right. Uh, the floor is open. Okay, Steve. Well, a bit unfair to put people on just like that, but there you go. Um, Steve's, Steve's got his hand up. Steve. Yes, just the, regarding the Bristol, the Colston statue, the, the council had, um, was in the process of changing the wording um, and also 
uh, in response to yeah. um, appeals to pull it down. Um, but it was there couldn't be agreement over the wording of the replacement panel. Um, so it got stuck. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. okay. I'm conscious we can't, we can't see you, Jeff, but fortunately we can still hear you. Are, yeah. are, are, there, are there any final points you'd like to draw together for us as our convener I, for I, today? I've, I've, I've made all my points. I mean, I, th I think that really the, the point is that, you know, this is a bringing history into what it's really best suited for, which is to try to help shape the present and indeed the future. Uh, and, and as such, you know, it's, a, you know it's, it's been done, you know, quickly and we need to continue to work out how best to do this. And clearly Zoom is one way in which we can get people from around the world to take part, which is wonderful. But it's, uh, it, it, it does make things slightly complicated. Um, I, I, I think really we've, we've, we've done an hour and a bit. We, we should now think of coming to a close. Yeah, okay. I mean, I, I'm sure we, we've covered a, an awful lot of ground and there's plenty more we could do, but then there'll be plenty more occasions when we can. You're absolutely right. To be bringing people together from such a, a wide geographical area is, is absolutely fantastic. And there's there's lots of other food for thought in, in things that people have said and, and challenging points that people have made. I would draw your attention to the motto which is on the library window, which is explore the past, change the future. And I think the conversation we've had today is as been all about that so uh, that's brilliant and I'm sure our founders Ruth and Eddie Fry would have been amazed that we can do this from my dining room table but also that that, uh, that, that we can all be uh, be so involved and so engaged so thank you very much indeed to everyone who's contributed and everyone who's who's been been listening away there uh, particularly to Jeff for, for uh, pulling it together also to uh, Ramilla for joining us from so far away but other people who, who've also um, come along oh, uh, Phil from France uh, I gather there was somebody from Johannesburg so brilliant okay but also great for people in Salford lovely to, to, to see you as well of course so thanks everybody next week we have got the next in our invisible histories talks and it's at the same time two o'clock and that's um, going to be looking back a hundred years uh, Steve Bond is going to talk to us about the Derbyshire boot and shoemakers strike of 1918 to 1920 and that's going to act also as the formal launch of an online display of photographs about the strike to replace the planned guest exhibition which was due to open in the library this month. So this talk has been recorded too, so if you've tuned in late or you want to, to uh, run it again, it will be going up on our YouTube channel within the next 24 hours. That's youtube.com forward slash WCM library. And finally, a reminder again that our talks are free, but if you feel able to donate to the library, we're always really grateful. There's a donate button on our website. So thank you very much. Take care. In solidarity, all the very best from the Working Class Movement Library.